don't block the, the path of inquiry. Don't lay down rules that make it impossible for people to ask important questions. Welcome to the Thought Stretchers podcast, where we hope to stretch your thinking about important issues in education through rich inquiry. My name is Drew Perkins, and I'm your host for these heterodox conversations for complexity. Hello again, and thanks for tuning in, as always. We're off and running here in 2024 with the launch of our Thought Stretchers Education Community, which is an extension of our professional development work. WeGrowTeachers.com is our main website where you can find all of our professional development work, and ThoughtStretchers.org is where you'll find the Thought Stretchers community. This community is meant to be a social media, kind of like a Facebook experience for educators who are looking to have conversations about complex and nuanced and sometimes challenging issues from pedagogy to culture war kinds of issues. And we'll also be offering some other things like events, book clubs, salon style discussions, and so on. We actually do have a book club author visit scheduled, Ron Richhart, who will be on a future podcast and has been a guest on previous podcasts. We'll be talking about his latest book, Cultures of Thinking in Action. That's scheduled for late February. And if you go to wegrowteachers.com and click on the menu item for our community, you'll see a link to go there. Or if you go to and register for our Thought Stretchers Education community, you'll see it in the events there. Speaking of events, we're tentatively planning our PBL Grow 24 event, which is our summer in-person event. For those of you who want to register as individuals or small groups to learn more about project-based learning, that will be in our home base of Louisville, Kentucky, again back at Lynn Family Stadium. It was a great venue last summer and we'll return there. We're looking at June 24th through 27th tentatively, but more information will be announced very soon. As always, thanks so much for paying attention to our work and sharing it with those folks who you think might be interested. You can always reach out to me at drew at thoughtstretchers.org. Americans on opposite sides of the political spectrum don't just disagree on the issues. More and more, they can't stand one another. This partisan animosity is the crisis of our time and threatens our nation. Braver Angels is here to address this. Our mission is to bring Americans together to bridge the partisan divide and strengthen our democratic republic. But no single organization, no matter how successful, can be powerful enough all on its own to heal this divide. If our goal is really to strengthen our democratic republic, our only practical strategy is to ignite and shape a broader movement for civic renewal. That's why we started Braver Network. At Braver Network, you'll find organizations from all across the country and all across the political spectrum that even when they disagree on the issues, come together to spark this movement for civic renewal. In building this network, we commit to equal representation, not just between conservatives and liberals, independents and nonpartisan groups, but also between national and community level organizations. At Braver Network, you'll find the whole gamut. From businesses and leadership organizations to educational and religious institutions, all committed to improving our politics and strengthening our nation. We're looking for leaders and members of all kinds of organizations who are ready to lead and take part in the movement. Joining is completely free, and the opportunities for collaboration are endless. Help turn the tides of toxic polarization. Check out BraverAngels.org to sign your organization up for Braver Network. In this episode, I spoke with Spencer Russell, who is an educator who has an interesting story from Teach for America and working in elementary schools, early elementary schools. And we talked about his journey to learn how to teach kids how to read. And he now has a program and a website called toddlersread.com with courses. A lot of that work is based in the science of reading and phonics, and so he's talked about some of the issues surrounding that in the so-called reading wars, talked about his reasons for using that approach over other approaches, and talked about the ways in which he works with parents directly and starting as young as, I think, 18 months or something like that to develop their ability to decode and read and be successful in that pursuit. Certainly an important topic, and we've touched on it before with Kareem Weaver and the Right to Read and the Reading Wars panel that we did with Emily Hanford and Natalie Wexler and a couple of other folks. 
So as always, I hope you enjoy this conversation and find it helpful. And here is my conversation with Spencer. I'm here with Spencer Russell. Spencer and I are going to talk about his work, which is Toddlers Can Read, and his work in that area. But, of course, I want to give Spencer a chance to say hello and introduce himself so folks know who they are listening to. Of course, appreciate the opportunity to be here, speak to your audience. My name is Spencer. My business is called Toddlers Can Read. My big thing is I help people teach their kids how to read. And the name is a little bit deceiving. I work with anybody, any parent whose kid is above about 18 months to two years old-ish, up to six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. If you've got a kid and you want to teach them how to read or they're reading a little bit but struggling, I've got resources to support you. Okay. Well, what's your what's your background? What How did you get into this? What was your, uh, I guess, training, for lack of a better term? Maybe it's not exactly training, but, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Of course. I taught kindergarten and first grade for six years here in Houston, Texas, won a bunch of teaching awards, thought I was going to be a teacher for life and was able to have uh, to network with a lot of different other teachers and uh, kind of highly accomplished people within the state. When I found out that my now wife uh, was pregnant, I knew I wasn't going to be able to be the kind of teacher I wanted to be and the kind of daddy I wanted to be. And so I, I, I quit teaching to, to work a job that I could do from home and, and have more time with my son. Uh, that role I did for three years is with a company called Teaching Lab. We do curriculum specific professional development for teachers. So I I primarily specialized in grade three to eight reading curriculum aligned to the common core shifts. So big shifts in how we look at text complexity, the role of knowledge and vocabulary schema, all these sorts of things. Uh, That was a huge focus during those three years. But again, during that role, there was kind of that tension of my big passion is, is, is teaching directly. Um, but now as my son is getting older and I'm kind of working this role, working more directly with, with, with teachers, there was something missing for me, um, like a, a, a bigger purpose and connection to actual teaching and education. And that's when I started Toddlers Can Read because I spent the last year or so teaching my son to read when he was two. And I knew he wasn't learning to read because he was smart or he was different or he was some kind of genius. It's because I was taking everything I learned from my role as a teacher, from my role leading professional development, and I was applying it to my son to see if he could do it, and he could. So I've I've done this work now the last two and a half years or so. I think in terms of training the -the on-the-job work, working day in, day out with thousands, tens of thousands of families has been incredible, working with kids from all over the country, all over the world, all different ages. And so even as I've kind of built this program and, and started to implement it, I've been learning even more about what works and how this applies to kids at different ages, kids at different abilities, kids at different backgrounds. Hmm, okay. So you have a te- you got a teaching certificate and you were in the classroom, you, I think you said six years. What, where'd you get your right. uh, teaching certificate from? So I taught in Houston through Teach for America. It's okay. an alternative certification program. And then you do all the exams and other stuff. So mm-hmm. that was my kind of introduction to the classroom and to teaching. Okay. And and so if I'm understanding, T- Teach for America usually takes folks who are, you know, I guess, recent college graduates. So you obviously, or I'm guessing you graduated from college and, and then matricul- matriculated into Teach for America. Where where did you get there? your, uh, I guess, your initial degree or whatever, I don't know how many degrees you have, but that degree that led you into Teach for America? Yep. Uh, I studied, I was a double major at Amherst College in Massachusetts. Okay. I studied music and psychology. And from there, wasn't sure what to do. Uh, Decided to do Teach for America, which, you know, many folks apply and some do. And it was a tough first year. Uh, Like most people coming to teaching, I was grossly underprepared. And most Teach for America core members who came to my school quit. So I was one of a couple who ended up making it through year one Mm -hmm. and, 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 and year two. And again, like at that point, a lot of people enter Teach for America. I don't know if the audience is familiar with this, but the goal is generally like, okay, two years and out. Like I'm, I'm going to get two years in. It's going to look really good on my resume. It's a selective program and then I'm going to leave. And I kind of came in with that same attitude. But partway through year two is, is when it kind of started to turn around for me. And I was like, okay, this is something that I can do. I'm, I'm, I'm getting better. I'm learning. I'm, I'm training. And wanted to do it for life, <laughs> but family happens life happens and you know when you're burning that bright it's tough to do that while also kind of taking care of a newborn 
Yeah, I think lots of people who are not educators, not teachers, don't have a, a sense of how hard it is, number one, just to be a teacher, just the schedule and the rigors of, of sort of being on all the time. But then to be a really, really good teacher, it, it really is very demanding in a number of ways. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to linger a little bit on the, the, the Teach for America and your preparation and training before we get into the meat of this, because it does strike me as interesting that you, as many early, you know, first year teachers or, or first or second year, that kind of thing, teachers do, they struggle, right? It's really, they realize it's hard, may not be for them. Uh, it's maybe compounded with Teach for America candidates because they haven't gone through a teacher preparation program. So they're jumping into it maybe with some, of, as you mentioned, so like two years and out, you know, boom, let's get get that on the resume. And I think there's maybe some financial incentives. I can't remember. I, I'm not that familiar with Teach for America, but the the getting into it and then sort of getting your sea legs and and then getting better at it that you mentioned one of the criticisms of course of teach for america is that there isn't that pre sort of pre-service certification process and training and and development into being a teacher uh, certainly a, a criticism of lots of criticism to have about pre-service and uh, not not you know the more traditional pathways and in, in the training that teachers get or don't get reading especially being one of them but I'm curious in that sort of first few years there where you got your sea legs and you you said you feel like you were getting better what were the things that helped you get better what were the things that you were doing were they on your own were they structural pieces inside the school and professional development or part of the program or all of the above it's a wonderful question and I think it's one of the most important things we need to look at within education I went to um it was like a a round table discussion with the governor of, of Texas a, a couple of years back. And I was one of a couple of people in the state who was invited, former national teacher of the year, state teacher of the year, kind of all these people who they wanted to bring in. And the topic of the conversation was how do we recruit and retain the best teachers in our, in our state? Mm-hmm. And you've got all these people, we went around the table, I was like the last person to go and everyone's saying, oh, pay us more, do this, do that, we want more money. You know, all these other responses then. When it's my turn to speak, I pulled the table and I said, how many of you were good teachers when you started? And people laughed, like 2017, National Teacher of the Year, 2019, 2020, Text Teacher of the Year, like people are, are, are laughing hmm. at this concept because they all sucked. And I was like, I sucked too. All of us sucked. How many of you had a coach? How many of you had a mentor? How many of you had someone who you studied and who helped to train you to become better? And it's every single person in the room. And for me, the key to improving, the biggest thing at the beginning was the decision, I've got to get better. Because there's this decision I had to make initially was, do I quit or or do I fight? Mm -hmm. And that do I quit was in my head for months. It it wasn't until uh, post December, sometime January or February, where I got the, okay, I'm not going to quit thing out of my head. So I have to fight. And once I got that in my head, it was who are the people in the building who are the best at this? And the this at that point was behavior management. I know people don't love that term. So whatever you want to call that term, Mm -hmm. the ability to have kids following directions, engage and join the lesson. And for me, it was the PE teacher. And I was dropping my kids off at PE. They were following her directions. They were listening. They were engaging. They were coming back happy. And initially, I was looking at it like, oh, she just has a better subject than me. I'm teaching math, she's teaching PE. It's more engaging. And then one day, I, I, I can't remember exactly why, but I just stayed in and I watched her. And I realized it, it wasn't because it was PE, it was because it was her. And I started trading my planning periods the second semester to just watch and observe her. And then I actually asked her for coaching. And so she would take her planning periods and she would observe me in my classroom and get feedback. And that was the biggest single thing after the decision that helped me improve was having Miss Williams as a mentor. And then I think kind of the duration afterwards, I started picking people, whether it's specific coaches from Teach for America to come to my classroom and observe and give feedback. Even after I finished, I wanted a really good coach to come in and give support, whether it's setting up video, taking video of myself in the classroom teaching and then watching it back to figure out where kids were disengaging or when to kind of pick up the pace. It was a lot of study, a lot of observation, a lot of coaching. And I, I truly believe that is the most critical thing teachers can do to get better. Yeah, well, good for you for, you know, I guess, taking advantage of and engaging because that in and of itself is, is is work. And, you know, you've also got, you already got a lot on your plate. And 
there's a sense of vulnerability that one has to have to say, all right, I'm, <laughs> as you said, the technical term, I suck. And, you know, I've got to get better at this if I'm going to do this. And, uh, you know, even the best teachers can get better and should should engage in those kinds of things. So you're, you, you started your work in Teach for America in Texas, but you said you went to, is it Amherst? And is that some Massachusetts? Yeah. Yeah. So did you grow up in the Northeast or how'd you get to Texas? And I think what Teach for America just kind of places you in some respect, right? Exactly. So I grew up in the Northeast. We kind of bounced around different states in New England, went to boarding school there and then went to Amherst. Uh, Teach for America there at the time, I don't know how it works now. It's a ranking system. Hmm. So I ranked both my preference for geographical location and then i ranked my preference for grade level Hmm. and i ended up getting both of my choices houston was my top choice at the time they had these charts on the website that said here's the teacher salary here's the cost of living and here's how many tfa core members are are in this region Mm -hmm. and i'm just doing math like okay houston looks like it pays better than mississippi and i'll have a relatively low cost of living I can make it for these two years and there's a lot of TFA core members there. So I'll have some built-in kind of social support. And from there, they may or may not heed your rankings and you get placed. And then I ranked early childhood number one, even though I didn't have experience with it. I just love kids. So wanted to work with little kids. And I also had this inkling that there might be more impact that some of the gaps that exist hmm. in later grades, I might have a little bit more control over closing those. Hmm. So some of the foundational up- pieces. Houston teaching kindergarten at a charter school. Hmm. Well, you're—I don't want to tell you that you're a bit of an anomaly, uh, being a male in early childhood, and uh, I'm sure you maybe felt a bit like a duck in, that was a duck out of water or something like that. But yep. yeah, I think it is really important. My, one of my daughters had a male kinder teacher, and I thought that was great. And you know, I think some of the the you know people talk about diversity, and th- that is one of those pieces that I think is a really important piece. Or can be helpful, right? Does it matter? Does it mean make a big big difference if if kindergarten or early educators are male or female probably not a huge huge difference but certainly interesting and i think probably a good thing to, if we had more balance there and balance in other places so okay so um if i were if you had a book i'd say well, what's your book about but uh, you don't have a book that i know of and uh, you have a website and a program so what's your program about we will have a book at some point. Okay. And the topic of that book is to be determined. My lane intersects with a lot of different genres. Okay. The, the two biggest being parenting and reading. There's also another kind of big genre of behavior and kind of like early childhood development. And so I I sit at the intersection of of all these different things. So I have a reading program. The reading program is about how to teach kids to read in a way that kind of balances two things, what we know from the science of reading in terms of how the brain learns to read with what we know about kids' behavior, with what we know about parental motivation and how to actually make this time during the day. Because unlike a teacher who has a dedicated reading block, parents are choosing whether or not to do this. So then they're trying to fit it into the day. And so there's a lot of other considerations outside of just what is the right way to teach reading that we have to build in for them to make this really easy and really simple. So that's the program, but I can't do that without parental support, without helping people navigate different challenging behaviors and things that might come up with their kids, without helping people structure this into the routine, without giving rationale for why they should be doing it and kind of swimming upstream against a large current of belief uh, in person and online about education that is, is not necessarily aligned to my belief that we can start a lot of this early and it can really benefit our kids. Hmm. So you're advocating for, I think, starting before they get to, I guess, kinder, so preschool, and of course, I'm sure you've heard the the question, why so early? Like, do they actually need to le- learn to read that early? Is that is that imperative? And and why would that be so important? Yeah, and, and to be clear, I'm not even advocating for it. Like, this is what I chose to do for my kid. From having taught kindergarten, my wife taught kindergarten. 
we saw the difference it made when kids entered kindergarten knowing how to read versus not. And we knew before he was born, our son's doing that. You can see this for people across different fields. If you have some kind of expertise in one lane and you've seen what happens to people that have expertise, you try to pass it on to your kid. We knew how to teach. We, we, we wanted to teach our kid to read and we thought it benefited him. But what I advocate for online is the parent's right. Like, I don't care about your decisions. Like what you do as a parent, what someone else do as a parent, I don't care, genuinely. But the fact that some people want to do this and are criticized or ostracized, to me, that's not okay. If someone wants to support their kid before kindergarten, for any number of reasons to like the why, and I'm, I'm not gonna say why they need to, because they certainly don't need to. Why might they want to? Lots of reasons. There's lots of black folks who wanna teach their kids to read because they don't trust the school system. There's lots of very conservatives and conservative folks in America who want to teach their kids to read at home because they don't trust the school system. There's people who live in uh, areas in, in, in zip codes. The socioeconomic status is such that they don't have the most resources at school. They want to help their kids get ahead. There's people who are looking at their own life saying, okay, reading was amazing for me. I want to help that be amazing for my kid. There's people like myself who say, I struggled with reading and I don't want my kid to have that conscious experience. And now growing up, he has no memory. He's five. He doesn't remember learning to read. He just knows he can read. And he doesn't quite get why other kids can't, you know? So there's any number of reasons why people might choose to. I don't care which reason they choose. I'm just here to say, if you want to do it, let's do it right. Let's stop doing these practices that you think are working, but aren't really, and are maybe causing even more damage down the road. Um, and let's stop making people feel like it is not okay, or it's somehow harming their kid if they decide to teach them how to read it early. Because that's a big misconception and it's absolutely not true. I just want to support the people who want to do it. And I have no negative feelings at all. I have friends and family members who are like, nope, let the school do it. Mm. And I, I would never say a negative word to them because that's your choice. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, I want to get into the practices and the method that the methods that you're that you're talking about. And um, we've we've had, you know, discussions here on the mm -hmm. podcast before, you know, the Reading Wars had Emily Hanford on as part of a panel with uh, Natalie Wexler and Kate Wynn, who's early elementary teacher up in Canada, and then Mickey Ray, who's the chief academic officer here in Kentucky, to talk about sort of some of the things my guess is you're going to mention, but so your decision with your wife is was to or has been to to teach your uh, son you said to read at an early age what were the determining factors or what what do you see as the value at such an early age for your child i don't talk about it much because i try to focus on other people and their kids and their rationale but his reading ability has impacted everything for context he is five and a half, he's partway through kindergarten, and he can read anything. It's been probably a year since I've put any text in front of him and had like the thought, oh, he might struggle with this word, I might have to teach this, anything. He can open up a dictionary, he can read it, start to finish, he might make two or three mistakes on the page, um, but smart mistakes. Mistakes where we might have a particular two or three letter combo that makes multiple sounds, and based on the context around it, it's a reasonable guess, but I mean, he's a very, very fluent reader. That impacts his day-to-day -day experience, whether it's out and about, this is kind of in like the casual, passive kind of way, out and about, he reads his own menus, he reads stuff as he passes, he's interacting with the world the way adults do and asking questions about it and learning. So he's picking up on a lot more information because there's this large percentage that we forget as adults, but a large percentage of the world around us is text. And he gets it in a way that other kids don't. And in a more active way, he reads all the time. He 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 loves to read. He's he's read hundreds of books. Um, you know, he finished the, the the Magic Treehouse series in a couple months. Uh, there's there's like sixty of them. And I don't say that to to say like oh like look at him he finished a series like he loved those. Like that's like sixty stories that he engaged with that he liked that he enjoyed. The other day for, for for breakfast, my wife made him like a special meal. Um, it was like a croissant French toast that looked really, really good. And we're doing this off on the shelf where he gets a, a new book every morning that he has to unwrap. And he would not go to eat until he finished that book because he was so into it. And that ability to get lost in a story is something that I think few kids have because very few kids have the reading ability, regardless of age, to feel confident picking up a book and going start to finish. 
it's obviously impacted his academics without going specifically into it. If, if you're in a city like mine and you want your kid to get into a private school or to have those sorts of opportunities, he can obviously test in anywhere he wants to go. Um, that's on like the more practical terms. He goes to school and he, he's not worried about reading or math, to be honest. He gets to focus on social skills, which there are more than enough social skills, lessons to learn, especially as an only child going to kindergarten to fill up your brain energy, right? Mm -hmm. And his energy is free from a lot of the academic tasks to be able to focus on that mm. um, and his vocabulary. Yeah. And I'll, I'll use my son here as, as a proxy for anyone. Anyone who speaks to him, his vocabulary, his oral language is off the charts because he's consuming so much more. There's expressions that we've never said out loud that he's never heard, he doesn't watch TV, but he's read in books and he uses those colloquially. So hmm. for us, it's been incredible. I have no regrets. I have regrets over other things in parenting. I don't have regrets over teaching him to read. It's been incredible. Are there any reactions that he gets at school from his classmates that that uh, I guess might be in reaction to having you know that kind of vocabulary? And and I, I don't obviously know his classmates, but my guess is, or my assumption might be that he his classmates aren't as fluent and as literate and uh, as good a reader and, and have those vocabulary pieces. And so do, have you noticed any any of that? Sort of, you mentioned the social skills and, and maybe, you know, sort of kindergarten. You said he's in kindergarten. Yep. Um, maybe kindergarten you wouldn't see any of it and maybe you wouldn't see any of it anywhere. But it, 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 anywhere, but it just struck me as, as a question that might be, worth asking uh, you know some of the social interactions and how kids might think he's different because you know hey he knows these big words yeah and to be clear he doesn't speak with them often but he drops them occasionally mm -hmm. correctly and then that's <laughs> that's always the funny part is listening to him use a phrase or expression or word correctly in context mm -hmm. um but to answer the question no haven't noticed any differences. Mm -hmm. um, he goes to a great school where, you know, many of the kids have different gifts and different abilities. Mm. Um, but it's at the end of the day, I think there's this misconception that like, if you can read and if you have good language skills and that sort of stuff going into kindergarten, like you're, you're, you're going to seem different. And like, no, the kids are kids. Like he's a little kid. Mm -hmm. he, he likes all different little kid stuff. Yeah, yeah. And he's very silly, very funny, likes a joke. Even when I taught kindergarten, I, I had kids like him who were really ahead in one area, but then you go to recess and there's other kids who are really ahead in running or jumping or coordination. And then you go to do this mathematical game. There's other kids who are really good at geometry and putting the shapes together and kind of arranging it. So mm -hmm. I see it as one small part of the day, but if you didn't know what I just told you, you'd meet him you're like, oh, that's a cute little kid. Mm -hmm. That's a cute, happy little kid. Yeah, and I'm on the website, and I'm assuming the picture of uh, oh, actually this is probably a picture of you, the little kid, um, and uh, maybe a picture of I'm assuming you and your wife uh, in the part as a dad and a book, and uh, yep. I'm assuming your son is face is, is covered by the book probably strategically, right. but um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Is uh, uh, one other question um, about that him and, and some of these things do you does he have devices do you have screen screens or is that something that you're pushing off until a particular time yeah i mean i don't know what you've covered on the podcast prior to this on, on screens and, and education but all research that i've seen uh it points to the fact that screens negatively impact kids they negatively impact us as adults too mm -hmm. so we did no screens of any kind period before two maybe before three um it was it was two or three years of, of nothing and so he didn't know what that was and if we went to a restaurant or something that was show, show screens we would leave if we're at like a family member's house there wasn't much travel at that point but any point during that window and their tv's on they'd have to turn them off and so he didn't really know what that was before that and we think that was really important for him um now he has a tablet that has no games on it it has uh movies that he gets to watch if we're doing a road trip he'll watch one movie and he has podcasts that he listens to and so um podcasts or audiobooks he likes to listen to the magic tree house after he finishes them hmm. so we really try to limit and be intentional about it um every now and then i'll, I'll take him to the movies as a, a treat but we've seen and i think kids 
whose screen time is is limited, you can actually see the effect on them really clearly. Just like someone who doesn't eat a lot of sugar who eats sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we can tell, okay, he's watched a little bit too much of this movie because now the behavior starting to change a little bit. It's starting to get under there, so cut it off. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's it's it, it, it's very very limited. And and I don't want to be divisive here because I know uh, some people take this as like a values judgment on on your parenting. I'm not making a value judgment at all. Um, like if, if people put their kids on screens again, that's their call. I think we owe it to our kids to read up on it a little bit to try and figure out you know how it's impacting them and to be intentional yeah. to not have it be mindless, but to say okay. If I'm gonna have my kid on screens, what does that look like for how long and why? How am I gonna monitor their behavior to determine if this is good or bad? And I actually had one post on social media on screen time that was like accepted by everybody, which I think is like really hard to do. <laughs> when you post about screen time, I was like, wow, like there's no negative pushback where essentially I said, and, and, and I believe that this is my stance is like, look at your kid, look at their behavior, Think about who they are now and who you want them to be. And if you look at your kid and you're like, we're nailing it. Like right now, who this kid is, their behavior, how they show up in social situations, how they feel about themselves, how they interact with the family, how they perceive the world around them. If you're looking at that, like, yeah, we're on track. This is good. Keep doing whatever you're doing. If it's 20 hours of screens a day and you're looking at your kid, you're like, this kid is on fire. Like, keep it up because you're doing something right. But if you're looking at your kid and you notice they can't sit in a restaurant without looking at a screen, right? They, they, they don't have the ability to interact and engage with the people around them. Or if you're, if you're taking away screens and they're throwing tantrums or you're becoming reliant on that to manage the kid's behavior for you, you look at them and you say, okay, this kid is not where I want them to be. And I think there's room for improvement. That's the point where I'm, I'm not saying get rid of the screen. I think monitor it, sample it, test it, and see if there's a more optimal balance for your kid. Yeah. Well, I, I, agree with you very very much i mean i'm uh, long in the tooth and old enough to have grown up without screens and or not not without screens but not without uh, but without devices like you know we have now my parents limited my tv to one hour a day i could like borrow an hour if i wanted to watch a movie we had little <laughs> handheld games that were more like calculators and you know little led lights that moved around little football games and stuff and you know those were fun but certainly nothing like what we have today i have two daughters 14 16 and no doubt i mean i think social media is certainly a big big piece of, of mental health but probably bigger and i think especially with younger kids is the opportunity cost and then the stamina which i think certainly relates to reading to be able to sort of sit and be okay with without those dopamine hits and yep. um yep. you know i've i've talked with folks about you know free range kids and, and independence and being able to to engage with the world and play together and those kinds of things and devices are a part of that but anyways uh well let's let's talk about your method uh sounds like you are an advocate for i think you even said the science of reading yeah, well, so that's like phonics and um, all the things that are, um, I guess, uh, advocated for and talked about by Emily Hanford and, and folks like that certainly has been you know, somewhat divisive in the world of education. There's the reading recovery folks. There's the balanced literary, literacy folks. Uh, I guess, yeah, explain how you think about you know, the process of reading, what's important, what have you seen? How did you learn those things and come to believe that the way that you're doing it is the, the best way? Of course. And to me, it is pretty basic. There are a lot of words in English. And if we were to try to memorize all of those words, we would be unsuccessful and it would take us a really long time. If we were trying to rely on picture cues or some sort of contextual cue, or a guess world based on shape, we would be unsuccessful and be trying for a really long time, especially once texts become more complex and we start seeing words in different contexts. I get message after message after message from adults who are reaching out to an account called Toddlers Can Read, sharing with me, I never learned how to read. People think I can read because I know some of these words I've seen, but if I see a word that is unfamiliar to me, I've never seen it before, I, I can't do it adults who 
go second when reading restaurant menus because they can't read and they want to hear someone else order so they can order the same thing. Adults who have loved ones who've never shared that with them, who can kind of get by and pass in day to day. But when you dig deeper and you show them anything more complex or anything new, they're unable to do it. And I think that's what a lot of these programs are, are, are teaching. We're putting a bandaid on it. And in, in my specific lean of helping little kids learn how to read, it's particularly bad because you'll see a lot of videos of kids with words on flashcards and they get lots of likes and views and stuff on, on social media where it's like, oh, look at this kid. They're reading 100 words or 200 words or 300 words. It's like, that's not going to do anything in your actual day-to-day -day reading ability. And oftentimes it's second, third, fourth grade parent-teacher conferences or some sort of standardized tests before parents realize your kid can't read. It looked like they could read, but they memorized some words or some cheap strategies. And I think that's where I align with the science of reading. Reading is a process of learning the sounds, which are largely reliable. There are statistics on every sound, every phoneme, and the reliability. And there are some, like the combination O-U-G-H, which there's, to my knowledge, I think six different variations of. None of those variations is above 50% reliable. And for those words, through or could or bolder, it's hard. Right, but that's a that's a fraction. It's a small, small fraction of the words in English. Uh, with learning phonics, and only a couple, kind of like quote unquote advanced rules of, of phonics situations in which a C might change its sound, or situations where the O O might say uh or ooh. Kids can read the vast majority of words in the language. Not only that, kids can learn phonics quickly. They can learn phonics through play and through games, which I'm a huge advocate of. When you see people working through my program, what's different than like, I think a traditional science of reading approach. I think science of reading gives a lot of the what, I think it often gives less of the how. And that's what I support parents with. We can go super deep into what kids should be learning. Okay, we get it, kids should learn phonics. How do you do it with a three-year-old in two minutes? How do you do it and fit that in your day? And what I teach people to how to do is, is, is do it through games, how to, how to narrow those 26 sounds into three that you're focused on and how to play games with those three and work them through a easy progression from just you give the kid the sound and they repeat it back to you to you have them identify which sound says what to they're actually producing it themselves. And that's the, that's the how that I, I get folks with, right? So the letter sounds really easy, really fun. Parents love it. Kids love it super, super easy. And then we have blending or decoding, which falls into the bucket of phonemic awareness. Again, science of reading is going to give you a lot of what. It's going to say, okay, here's phonological awareness, then here's phonemic awareness, then here's blending, here's segmenting, here's onset, and here's rhyme, and here's beginning sound manipulation, like all that technical stuff. The how, how do you take this bucket of blending and teach it to a kid in five minutes a day? That's what I provide folks with. Let's play these out loud games. Here's what you say. Here's what they say. And when they struggle with it, here's how you intervene. To me, this is basic foundational skills that kids need. And if people want to teach reading another way, like I'm not like in the reading worse in the sense of I think some people, it is their career mm -hmm. to fight about this, mm. to talk about this, to get upset about this. That's what like, everybody that's wants to do. That's not my job. Everybody wants to that's fight. Not, <laughs> everyone wants to fight, but... The issue is when adults fight, kids lose. Like there is nothing in it for the kids having all these intellectual conversations. Like I'm not there for that. I'm there to say there are millions and millions and millions of parents online. I'm reaching 3 million of them. Millions of people online who want to support their kids how to read, who don't know what conversations are happening up here, that don't know what Natalie Wexler wrote in her book or what Emily Hanford put in her podcast. They have no idea about that. They just want to help their kids. Mm -hmm. And when they see my videos, they see it's common sense. Mm -hmm. I can play letter sound games with my kid. I can teach them how to blend. And if I stay consistent with that for a month, my kid's going to be reading. So how did you... That's the lane that I try and stay in. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. So how did you get to that position? You know, again, Teach for America, so you didn't have formal teacher training. Uh, again, there's lots of criticism of teacher training. One of them, as I mentioned, is around you know, learning or teaching, learning how to teach kids to read. And, you know, Emily Hanford, the contention of the, the folks on the science of reading uh, advocacy side 
would would say and they claim and probably very very true that lots of the teacher prep you know gives the balanced literacy or reading recovery or some versions of that and omits and overlooks the the phonics so i'm curious how you in your experience came to i guess know about and embrace the 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 science of reading kinds of concepts in instead of balanced literacy or reading recovery or or anything else yeah i started with a lot of those approaches we had like our guided reading program forget what it's called um forget what we use but it was very much like let's give our kids leveled readers let's 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 group them based on level let's teach them to memorize these we had a list of 60 in kindergarten i think more in first grade that's what i started doing i don't remember the exact shift we, we always had a good phonics curriculum but we were doing a lot of those reading strategies at the same time but towards the tail end of my teaching career i got very into data and this is really what drove my class forward when you saw like the data explode for my kids and i tracked everything and when i say everything i mean for a class of 28 first graders every one of the 44 uh sounds in our phonics curriculum I, I i had a box for every kid whether they had it or they didn't and i pulled small groups not based on like quote unquote just level generally but based on like which kids don't know which specific groups of sounds mm -hmm. let's practice those and give every kid the sound they need everyone gets pulled every day every subject every area i had the same data on spelling or segmentation how many sounds can you segment at a time? I had the same data on handwriting, on punctuation, on capitalization. I had the same data on blending um, and the same data across a bunch of different mathematical domains. And this was something that I spent a ton of time doing. I mean, a ton of time. My spreadsheets were impeccable. And I think it was that process of tracking where I began to see patterns in data that people don't typically see. And I'm also seeing the impact and I'm saying, okay, if I teach these, if I pull this group and I teach these these three sounds or these four sounds, it only takes them like three days to get it. And I, 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 I can pull them again and do it. And by the end of the week, I had weekly assessments on Friday. Every week on Friday, my kids are moving and like really, really moving. Versus if I continue to teach whole group to the whole class and just say, okay, today's sound is AI saying, A. let's practice it. Let's write it, whatever, like, we would have moved at a quarter of the pace. And a lot of my instruction became, how do I give a task really, really quickly that would give me a really, really quick formative assessment of where my kids are at, track that data as quickly as possible, then pull kids based on that skill. So maybe the phonics skill is AI. Maybe we're partway through the year. We haven't introduced all the sounds. This is a new sound. I can write that on three flashcards in different words. I'm not going to use like an irregular word like said, but I might use a word like paid and just flash it to the kid. Can you read this? Bam, bam, bam. First one they miss, marking it as no. Show each kid. All of a sudden I've pulled my class to the 10 kids who don't know it, the 15 kids who do, and now I've got 10 kids to pull to a group. And this sounds kind of technical, but the data in seeing the impact to me, I think was the learning process because I'm not one who believes a ton in qualifications. Like, I don't really care what someone's certification is. I don't really care what their degree is in the education space. I think people put a lot of weight on like researchers and theorists. I'm very interested in the practitioner who's getting results because you can have a school of a hundred teachers. They can all have the same qualifications. They can all have the same certifications, all have attended the same programs, but the results are gonna be very, very different. And I'm concerned, why are some people winning? Why are some people getting incredible results and why are some people's kids moving? And I think a lot of that happens with teachers who are super self-reflective, people who are tracking data really, really closely and who are adjusting. And that's a huge part of how I ended up building the Toddlers to Read program and tracking it with my son is I've always been studying this. Even as I was teaching, I studied it when I did professional development, I studied it with my son and now I'm studying and, 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 and kind of following up on families as they're taking the program. So it sounds like the school you were working, where you were working, was using maybe a mix of some phonics and some what balanced literacy kinds of approaches, maybe a, sort of a, a grab bag of things. And as you, you know, mentioned, you know, seeing the differences and results. 
One of the pushbacks or criticisms and, and people say about sort of science of, of reading and use of phonics and all of this sort of intentional practice is that the, I, I guess you can, you can say it one of two ways. One, that it can be really boring with kids. I know you mentioned the sort of play factors, so I'm, I'm assuming that you try to integrate some of that to, to ameliorate any of the any of those effects as, as much as they may or may not be present. The other way to say it is that the, the sort of, I think, balanced literacy reading recovery folks are talking about developing this like love of reading, right? You know, you find your little cubby and, you know, you learn how to be a reader and that's what, that's what reading looks like. And that there's sort of a culture and enculturation of readers and that kind of thing. So I'm curious if you had any, as you started using some of the phonics pieces, did you encounter some of those issues of, you know, whether it's boredom or stamina or feeling like it's, you know, maybe drill and kill is too extreme a a phrase to use, but, um, you know, that, that kind of response from kids and, and if so, were there modifications that you made based on that? It's a wonderful question. I think a lot of the science of reading stuff and resources is boring. A perfect example of this is decodable text. We put text in front of kids with words that are phonetic, that are based in some kind of so- scope and sequence of sounds the kid has learned. And when you do that, you're limited by the words that you can choose. And so you can't say, you know, this character, use their full name, plays with this character because the word play is gonna have the AY combo, the character name probably has something regular in it, the width has a TH, what they made it, may or may not have learned. You would have to say like, Sam can hit it. You know, like there's some confines on, on that. Mm-hmm. But as we made our decodable books, we were trying to look at how do we make this actual fun? So we paid a ton of money for an illustrator because most good books are illustrated well, most decodables are not. We were really intentional about character names, about plot, about character development, all these sorts of things. And like, is it gonna win a like prize for like best writing for a children's book? No, but we are intentionally trying to make it more interesting and more engaging in a way that I think the field has yet to do. Uh, I think we we focus in, in the science of reading community largely on just literally factually, is this right? Does this follow the right sequence? And we've missed part of the reading experience, which is like kids wanna see colorful, beautiful pictures. Kids want to get to know characters and learn and play. And and I feel like it's the same thing with our flashcards, like big, thick, sturdy, colorful, engaging. Like flashcard isn't the sexiest topic, but (laughs) we try to have resources that kids actually like and they want to play with. And I think a lot of times science of reading stuff can be boring. That said, I have a, a deep belief in teaching that no topic is inherently interesting or inherently boring that it is about the way in which we're taught and that thing is delivered and that thing connects with us. And a really good teacher can make a boring topic interesting and a really bad teacher can make an interesting topic boring. So when I saw my kids getting more and more engaged, it's when my teaching moves were better. My pace was higher. I was keeping more of the class engaged. I had like great checks for understanding and I was like very appropriately challenging people because kids really like to be challenged and supported. They like to know that we believe in them. And that's the stuff I think we need to, to bring in and say, okay, this is how we take the science of reading and we actually make it like enjoyable for kids. And that's, yeah. I think, part part one of your question. Part two, this uh, let's sit around a circle and just read books. Let's explore books and just kind of absorb the code to be able to read. I think it's beautiful in theory. It's not super effective in practice. It is a myth that's perpetuated largely by folks with many, many resources with the ability to help support their kids if and when they fall behind. And it is not an approach that is being embraced by the people who are traditionally the least served by the educational system, which are black, brown, Hispanic, folks with low resources, low income in rural areas. Like the vast majority of the country is, is, is fighting for the right to read and to be taught how to read well. 
And there's a small population of people that's driving a large narrative to say that like kids, all kids learn eventually, you know, if we just read to them enough and we expose them to books and we let them explore on their own, they'll get it. And you and I spoke before this started. I'm in Houston now. You lived in Houston before. Like, what are families doing in Houston? What are wealthy families doing in Houston whose kids go to school with that approach? With the approach of, you know, just get the book from your cubby. Just read about the topic. Readers, writers, workshop. What are they doing? They're all getting tutors. They're all getting tutors. Many of them are contacting me directly and asking me to tutor. Many people are coming to me after another tutor. In my neighborhood where I live, tutor, tutor, tutor. I just got off a phone call before this call. No joke, four minutes before I got on with a wealthy mom calling my cell phone, asking me to tutor. Yeah. Well, yeah, it is it is interesting and it's complex insofar as that it's hard to, like people I think don't really seem to be able to connect the dots partly because many kids will actually learn to read without like super explicit phonics kind of things, right? So that's what I was, uh, you know, that that's what I, as I understand it, that there's about 60% of kids will learn to read even without a really intentional phonics and science of reading kind of approach. And then, of course, getting into the knowledge and the comprehension pieces. But then that leaves, uh, you know, and, and it also that also doesn't explain or doesn't show whether how effective they are at reading. I mean, are exactly. they basic readers or are they really good readers? Do they like to read or is it just sort of functional at a basic level? And then there's that 40%, which is a large number, right? It's not as large as 60, but it's a large number. You mentioned the right to read. Um, I'm assuming you've seen the right to read documentary. I had Kareem yep. Weaver, uh, I think it's Kareem Weaver who's in that. He yep. was on the podcast right. at one point, yeah. And, uh, you know, he echoes some of the same things. It's like, you know, find what works and do it. Find find the people that are doing good, good work and getting results and do that. But it can seem like you're doing good work if 60% of your kids are reading and, you know, you're still working on that 40%. But it's, it's, it's much more complex than that. How do you think about, I mean, we've talked a lot about the early education, you know, kindergarten and, and super young kids and phonics and then getting into the to the stages where okay they can decode but now they they also have to there's more than just decoding right so what are some of the things that you do or emphasize in developing readers and comprehension and those kinds of things right and i think just to reiterate what you said maybe folks are reading but how well are they reading i could say the same thing about basketball like i can play basketball i don't play basketball well Mm -hmm. And if I lived in a society where the ability to play basketball impacted my career opportunities, my financial earning capability, almost every aspect of my day-to-day -day life, I would have wished someone taught me how to play basketball explicitly. Mm -hmm. I would have wished someone taught me to dribble with my left hand and how to shoot a free throw, right? Like just because I can do it doesn't mean I can do it well. And I think if you ask most parents, do you want your kid's reading ability to be better or the same? They would say better and they'd be able to point to specific reasons why not parents of, of, of five to six year olds parents of eight to 15 year olds right it, you know like they could point to specific reasons why that would have benefited them over their educational career or their personal journey so if if, if we have and all the stats in this that i've seen vary it'll be similar things but it always says something different a a, a, a roughly an eighth grade reading level among adults in our, in our country then I think you can very easily make the argument that even if someone does learn how to read, they can probably be taught to read in a way that is better and is, is going to benefit them more long term. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, comprehension is a big question, and it's one that I don't tackle much yet. We are working on more resources to support older readers. And there's kind of two camps here. There's kind of like younger kids who are really good at reading, like my son. And then there's like kids who are older who are struggling to read. And that's a huge camp of people too. And so as I kind of rebuild and restructure my third course, which is the most advanced one, I'm adding more information on specific rules and patterns, which is going to assist with spelling. 
and more on fluency, being able to actually read with a little bit less effort, more accuracy, more expression, which is, you know, not in a huge way, but fluent reading, like that kind of prosody does benefit comprehension too. Um, there's a lot of big buckets outside of that, that are tougher for me to tackle and would just be a longer term project. So uh, my understanding of, of comprehension, and this is what we taught uh, our teachers when I work for uh, the professional development company, is our most recent knowledge on comprehension challenges the notion that a lot of us grew up with, which is we increase comprehension by just asking a bunch of questions. And we've all got the, um, you know, Bloom's taxonomy in our head, which if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's like a pyramid that has like, you know, factual questions at the bottom. And um, it's like analytical at the top, I think. And then critical thinking below that, it's 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 just like a, a hierarchy. And what we were taught at, as, as teachers, many of us, I won't say all, is that after you read with the kid, maybe during, but often after, you have to ask them questions and you have to work from factual questions up to inferential questions, up to critical thinking, up to analytical. And you 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 kind of work a kid up a progression. And as you get higher on the pyramid, the, the questions become more and more complex. What we know is that one of the biggest factors in comprehension is text complexity. It is literally how complex was that text that you read. So you can read Shakespeare uh, and you can read Green Eggs and Ham. You can ask factual questions about both, but the factual questions about Shakespeare are going to be a little bit harder because it took you some effort to actually figure out what's happening in that book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, philosophy is an incredibly hard genre to understand. Uh, for me personally, my mortgage documents, legal documents, it is, it is a difficult genre for me to understand, even though my reading ability is great. So what I tackle right now is I tackle reading ability. The easier it is for you to read, the more mental space is freed up to comprehend, and every study supports that. Your reading ability matters. But the text, the text complexity matters a ton. Your background knowledge on the topic, your understanding of that thing, and your mm -hmm. schema matters a ton. Your vocabulary matters a ton. And outside of just the complexity of the text, the structure of that text matters a lot, meaning some texts are kind of you know, start to finish tells the story in order. Some move out of order sequentially. Uh, some kind of have different scenes happening concurrently. So all of that stuff really, really matters. And to come up with what I essentially try and do is come up with full courses that parents can take with no background knowledge, no teaching experience, nothing. Go start to finish and teach the kid how to read. To do that for comprehension to me is incredibly important and is also beyond the scope of what we focus on so far, because I, I do have a belief that the vast majority of kids' comprehension struggles because the vast majority of kids struggle with reading. And I'm trying to attack it from that lens. But you're right, there does need to be folks who are talking with parents and educating parents, as well as educators, which we did, saying, here are ways to build your child's background knowledge. Here's ways in their day-to-day -day life to building their language and the vocabulary and their schema. Here's ways to have them add on to their thoughts and, and ideas. Here's the different types of books that you can be reading with them to expose them to different topics and different genres and different levels of complexity. Like all that stuff needs to happen. It's just challenging for me at this stage to, you know, wrap that in and, and, and package that together along with the actual, you know, just reading, decoding fluency work. So one of the questions I'm sure that you get at least occasionally and probably should get every time from folks who might be interested in your work and, and, you know, give you a chance, certainly before we jump off here to talk about the actual products, because you've got a bunch of them here on the website, but you know, so what's the research, right? Um, what do you, how do you talk about research and what research have you found valuable? If, if you can point to any, any researchers that you can point to that you uh, really value or, um, things like that. Yep. Um, we don't have a lot of folks who question the academic research. We have a lot of folks who question the age, like, mm. you know, what, what's the research behind being able to teach a kid this early or that sort of thing. There's a lot of like really bad, like quote unquote studies online mm. about, you know, the impact of, uh, early education on long-term effects 
And so we've gone through, uh, I think, eight of the most widely kind of cited studies on like early childhood ed- education and people's perceived negative impacts on that that are like super widely. And, and we've written up multiple page reviews on each. And in that process, we, we've gone through dozens and dozens and dozens of, of studies on those topics. In terms of uh, research to support the approach to reading, it's a mix. Some of it is researchers and research articles. A lot of it is books and its authors uh, who have then an extensive list of citations. So uh, as an example, yesterday, we're kind of working on and finishing up this 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 third course. One of my favorite authors is Wiley Blevins, uh, who, who, who writes these kind of like practical guides like phonics from A to Z that take and synthesize a lot of research, but make it practical which is essentially what what I'm going for. And he has all these really useful graphs and charts. And I've noticed in a lot of my reading, I've got a couple of books next to me, whether it's Logic English or this or the ABCs and other tricks. A lot of people have cited the same study uh, from 1966, I believe. And I don't have it pulled up in front of me to remember the author's name, but there was this like thousand page study uh, from 1966 where they looked at every word in the language and they categorized it by the frequency of each sound. So it might take the Z sound, which we traditionally think of as Z. And it has, you know, Z represents that sound this percent of time, S represents it this percent of time, ES represents it this percent of time, SS represents that percent of time. And a lot of times the way that we'll use research is we'll be working on a course or working on idea. We'll read a, a bunch of other books, but then we'll be looking for more specific information that the book can provide. In this case, uh, Blevins only looked at and ranked and gave numerical values on the two most common sounds for each letter. And we wanted to see every possible permutation of, of that letter. And so we went to the original source to kind of pull that out. Um, but yeah, there, there's there's a lot of research backing the science of reading generally. I, I, I try not to spend a lot of time, to be honest, looking for like rationale for a conversation or like evidence of, of why it's right when like everything in me and in my experience day to day says this works and this is doing well. Um, but when there's a specific topic or subject that we need to learn more about or we're not sure, like the frequency of a specific phoneme, when I was doing my blending words course, this was was huge is it's it's is how what is the most effective way to teach kids to blend words that was a a big big question for me because most parents struggle with that then we're going through and we're checking are there any articles that are written on this topic is there any data or evidence to suggest that one approach is better than another that sort of thing and for a lot of the stuff the data in the research as far as i've seen is tbd um similar with like embedded mnemonics is is a big topic in the science of reading and it's something i'm not like super super f- familiar with but the decision whether to embed the letter within a picture in order for kids to retain that information i know ari has written a lot on this there hasn't been like a, a lot of research but she's looked at this specifically and uh you know sometimes when you go in with those specific questions you get great answers and oftentimes you know and in the case of embedded mnemonics there is some research to suggest that it works and that it's, it's, it's effective and it's helpful. You know, you can put the A in the shape of an apple and the, the kids can hang on to that more. The way that it's used right now in the science of reading is not embedded mnemonics. It is just mnemonics. It's an A next to an apple. And that's very, very different. And there's no research as far as I've found to support that. Mm-hmm. But very, very long answer to, I think, describe our approach, which is every now and then, from either people's comments, uh, questions people ask us, or just products that we're working on, we will seek to answer specific questions to understand has the research found a better way to do this or a more effective way to do this. Sometimes we hit, to be honest with you, many, many times we don't. Um, and they're just like very specific questions that have never been actually meaningfully answered yet. Okay. Well, I uh, want to give you an opportunity to talk about actually the, the products because you've got courses, you've got, it looks like books, which I imagine are sort of part of the courses and then flashcards and all kinds of things. So if I'm a parent, which I am, but not, not of, uh, my, my daughters thankfully can read at 14, 16. 
And uh, But if I'm a parent of a young one and, and thinking about doing something like this, or, I mean, maybe even a teacher to think about maybe engaging with some of these kinds of things, what what's your, uh, I guess, your elevator pitch? I don't have a great elevator pitch. I try not <laughs> to pitch, you know. it's I probably should pitch people and sell it harder. I really don't. Um, what I would say is, like, if you want to help your kid learn to read, I have a free workshop that you can take. It's 26 minutes. It's super high value. You can watch it. You can get a sense of the very basics. So how are we approaching teaching kids to read? What are the stages? And what can you do really practically and really simply at each stage? And I say, just watch that. See how that resonates. See if, if this feels like something that you want to do and you feel comfortable doing. If it's not, like, no sweat come back to it, come back to the resources if and when you need more support with your kid. And if it is, then you've got a couple steps you can take. You can jump in and get started. You really don't need much to teach your kid to read. Pencil, paper, we'll do it. Like you you can do everything with that. Uh, Or you can check out my actual courses, which is what we spend the most time working on, researching, planning, executing, And those are video courses where I'll I'll sit down and I'll talk you through how to do this. I'll show videos of me coaching kids through the same process, me working with parents so you can actually see the before and after and see these strategies working in real time. We've got products like books and flashcards. We're adding a bunch more, whiteboards, markers, erasers. I want to make it really easy for people to do this, but the products to me, like that's not the thing. Like lots of people buy stuff and stuff only works if you know how to use it. And that's where I think the workshop and the courses are where to go. If you, you, you buy the courses, they'll come with the stuff too, you know, so you'll, you'll, you'll get that stuff to get started. And that's really why we're creating all, all these things is so that eventually, not now because it takes a lot of time and money, but eventually once people buy our, our program, they get a, a beautiful box to their house with all the stuff you need to get started. All, all, all the stuff that I've got at my house, you get it yours too. But I, I can't tell you the number of people who've bought our flashcards, or bought our books or any of that other stuff. And the kids probably have made zero progress because the parent hasn't actually made the decision to work with their kid. And mm-hmm. that's a okay. No judgment for me. I'm saying if you want to teach them, I would go for the workshop or go for the courses. Something that's going to actually teach you the theory behind it so that you feel confident when you jump in to work with your kid. All right. Well, it sounds like the 26 minute free workshop might be just a long elevator ride and, uh, you know, to, to kind of give them a, a little meat to put on the bone and, and help them make some of the decisions that might lead to sort of next steps. So, Spencer, I really appreciate the conversation. And certainly, you know, one of the things that we've talked about here in the podcast several times is the 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 reading wars, for lack of a better term, and thinking about how we help kids to read. Our reading statistics and the ability of kids to read or the statistics around the the, the lack of ability of, of kids to read is pretty abysmal. So it's pretty clear to me that we've got some work to do. And as parents, you know, as you mentioned, sort of it's like how do you how do you engage with these things and how do I help my my student in situations where perhaps you know, the school may not be for whatever reason, and there could be a variety of reasons. So I appreciate the conversation. Anything else you want to get out on the table? I know the website is toddler. Is it toddlersread.com or toddlers can that's read? Right. Toddlers read. Toddlers read.com. Yeah. Yep, that's we'll, right. We'll put that in the show notes. Any other links or places they should find you? Nope. That's, that's, that's great. Just one note on the reading wars. I don't like it. I don't like them. And I, I know it's kind of impossible for me to talk about what I do without contributing to that in like some way, shape or form. Um, I obviously align with one side of the aisle, which is the science of reading and teaching kids to read through phonics mm-hmm. and phonemic awareness. But I strongly believe that our focus should be directly to parents, directly to teachers, not directly to other people in a theoretical space, talking about theoretical concepts. like. This is real life and you can give people as much information and as much data as you want about how to help their kid. But if you don't teach people what to actually do, they're going to struggle. And the same thing applies with teachers. There's a lot of teachers right now who are like, okay, science of reading, I see it, but what do I do? Tell me what I do in my blog. Tell me how to start it. Tell me what I say. Tell me how I teach it. 
And I think that's where our energy should be focused. So I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to fight on, on, on a theoretical <laughs> front. I'm, I'm just answering the questions that you're asking. I'm an advocate for working directly with the people who work with our kids and teaching them what to do day to day. Yeah. Well, that makes perfect sense to me. And as I said before, I appreciate the conversation. Certainly an important one. Of course. What we need to do is spend enough time together that we can start to translate our ideas into each other's language and include one another in this community of inquiry. And that is the work of love.